So welcome to our webinar this evening, which is an update on anti-Semitism in America. I am Roz Topolsky with the Vernon Area Public Library, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Grace Hayek from Glencoe Public Library and Beth Keller from Highland Park Public Library. But this program is actually brought to you by 12 Chicago area libraries, and I'm going to include all of them because we, we really appreciate their support from all of these organizations. So our partner libraries tonight include Cook Memorial, Deerfield Public Library, ELA, Evanston, Glencoe, Highland Park, Indian Trails, Lincolnwood, Skokie, Wilmette, Winneka and Northfield, and Vernon Area Public Library. So together, these 12 libraries have worked together to bring you this program about this important and unfortunately timely topic. Um, Anti-Semitism has been called the world's oldest hatred, but with the recent increase in anti-Semitic acts and headlines, we felt that now was the right time to discuss this topic with our communities. We're using the webinar format for Zoom tonight Please put your questions in the Q&A and we will, take, we will take your questions at the conclusion of the program and we will do our best to get to as many of them as possible. At the end of the evening, you'll see a survey on your screen and we hope that you'll take a minute to complete the survey because we would really appreciate your feedback on tonight's program. Now I'm gonna turn things over to Grace who can tell you a little bit about tonight's speakers. All right, thanks Russ. Um, uh, tonight's speakers are Sarah Van Loon of the American Jewish Council and moderator Jason Mark. Um, established in 1906, the AJC is a Jewish advocacy group that is, according to the New York Times, widely regarded as the Dean of American Jewish Organizations. It works to further civil liberties for Jews, and it works on behalf of social equality for all. Um, here's how the evening will unfold. We're going to have a, there will be an opening conversation between Sarah and Jason. Um, Sarah will then present her research for 15 minutes or so, and then the two of them will uh, return to discuss her research and then we'll respond to questions from the audience. Um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jason. Jason is the senior producer of WBEZ's Curious City, which is a weekly podcast, radio, and digital feature that answers questions from listeners about Chicago area his history and culture. He also hosts WBEZ's eclectic music program, Radio Z. And he will tell you uh, more about Sarah. Sarah, Jason, it's very good to have you both here tonight. And Jason, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, all right, I want to start off with a little bit of a joke for a very serious topic, okay? And it's a little bit of an updated version of this joke, all right? There are two Jews sitting in a coffee shop reading their tablets, and one is reading a Jewish newspaper, the forward, and the other is reading the far-right neo-Nazi blog, Stormfront. And the first one says to the other, how can you possibly read that horrible anti-Semitic filth? And the second one smiles and says, what does your Jewish paper say? We're assimilating, we're intermarrying, we're declining, we're arguing amongst each other, and we're divided on everything from politics to Israel. And what does Stormfront say? The Jews control the banks, the Jews control the economy, the Jews control the media. I feel so good when I read it. If you want to hear good news about the Jews, always go to the anti-Semites. All right, well, you don't have to dive too deeply into the news to see some story about anti-Semitic speech or acts of vandalism against synagogues or Jewish cemeteries or acts of violence against Jews. And if you feel like anti-Semitism is on the rise, it's because it is. And our expert guest for the evening has been tracking that rise. Once again, please welcome Sarah Van Loon from the American Jewish Committee here in Chicago. Thank you, Jason. I'm happy to be with you here tonight, even though we are having a, a more serious conversation, even though yes. it's always good to begin with a laugh. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, the, the Jewish world is a bit of an alphabet soup. There's the JUF and the AJC and APAC and J Street and HIAS and so many more. So could you please just give people a, a brief 
history of the AJC and what their mission is. Absolutely. So AJC, the American Jewish Committee, we are the leading global Jewish advocacy organization. Our mission is to enhance the well-being of the Jewish people and Israel and to defend human rights and democratic values in the United States and around the world. So this topic is timely because combating anti-Semitism is just one of the ways in which we at AJC go about advancing our global advocacy work. We also do it through global diplomacy, through strategic political advocacy, through interfaith and intergroup bridge building and coalition building, and also through strategic communications. Because as I'm sure we'll get into tonight, particularly when it comes to combating anti-Semitism, it's going to take a multi-prong approach and involvement, not just from the Jewish community in order to see real change that's going to impact society as a whole. Great, and I've seen lots of people give lots of definitions about anti-Semitism and what it is. Uh, one that has always struck me the most is from um, the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, who said anti-Semitism is so difficult because it's not a single coherent belief, but a set of contradictory beliefs. We were hated because we were poor, and we were hated because we were rich, and we were hated because we were communists and we were hated because we were capitalists and we were hated because we keep to ourselves and we were hated because we supposedly infiltrate everywhere. And one group hates us because we're too attached to our places and our superstitions and others hate Jews because we were seen as a rootless people who don't believe anything. Now, you've got to admit that it's pretty impressive to be despised and singled out for everything or anything that you do, even when those things completely contradict each other. Uh, and as Sarah Silverman says, if the Jews control the world, how come they have such bad PR? But how, <laughs> how does the AJC define anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic acts? Absolutely. So AJC utilizes the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. I, I call it IRA as a shorthand. Um, and that describes anti-Semitism as a certain perception towards Jews. And it may be expressed as a hatred towards Jews, but not always. So it could be rhetorical or physical manifestations. And quite frankly, it can even be targeting non-Jews. It's part of what makes anti-Semitism, just as you kind of described so difficult exactly to define. And this is where the International Holocaust Working Definition is helpful, because not only does it provide a, a much clearer framework of what it is, it also provides 11 contemporary working examples, which can be utilized by governments and law enforcement, by elected officials, by corporations, to really help define when is something anti-Semitic or have anti-Semitic intent, and you know what actions can we take from there. So kind of a, as a little bit of a background for it. You, what, you mentioned uh, Rabbi Michael Sachs, uh, Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory. I also like to use one from Deborah Lipstadt, who is the US envoy for anti-Semitism. And she says that while for other forms of hate, it looks like it's punching down at that group, for Jews, it can look like you're punching up. And I think that's a little bit of what makes anti-Semitism so difficult to pinpoint or, or for non-Jews in particular to understand why it's so harmful, because it can say, well, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about the Jews. You do control this, or you are really privileged with that. And it doesn't fully grasp the full understanding of the hatred that uh, the Jewish community is facing and the real dangers that come along with that. And it was mentioned at the beginning of the program that this is in many ways the world's oldest hatred. Uh, some have also described it as the world's most dangerous hatred because what starts with the Jews never ends with the Jews, as yeah. the saying says. What, what exactly does the author of that quote mean by that? 
Yeah, well, I think, I mean, you can just look to the history of the Holocaust, right? It wasn't just 6 million Jews who were murdered in, in a horrific genocide. It also then went to others. You know, the Nazis started with their idea of a, a pure race. And then in addition to the Jews, it added on any other group. But I think here in the context, particularly for AJC's work, we see what happens when hate is left unchecked in a society, when hate is left to fester, particularly anti-Semitism, because we understand what it's like as a minority community in the United States. And we know the very real dangers because particularly when it's you know rhetoric or something that's written online, people may think, oh, well, that's just a crazy person. You can just dismiss that. But we as the Jewish community, we understand firsthand how dangerous words are because we've seen time and time again just how much that translates into physical violence and actions. Anti-Semitism in many ways is a conspiracy theory, you know, and even though there are lots of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and what makes it so dangerous for society as a whole is it creates, you know, it, it helps enhance others. And by that, I mean, Oh, well, I can't trust them. And how do you know about this? And, you know, it breeds more distrust and um, in a community, particularly in the Midwest, in the broader Chicago metro region where we're in now, having a more divisive and isolated community puts us in danger. And why do I say it in such stark terms? Because that is where extremists and in, in the context of our conversation, anti-Semites are able to really thrive. It pits communities against one another. It makes people think that resources are limited and folks, you know, um, have limited bandwidth to care about something, right? Like, oh, well, I can't focus on, on the Jews. Yeah, anti-Semitism is bad, but it's not as bad as what's happening with this community. And personally, I kind of, I reject that, that type of thinking. I think we have, all as humans have the capacity to be good human beings, to care about the others, but also to understand that my standing up for, let's say, the Latino community here in, in, in the broader Chicagoland area doesn't take away from anybody else also talking up about anti-Semitism or me being able to combat anti-Latino hate just as I'm also combating anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic rhetoric. So I, I think there's a lot of different ways in which they can overlap this, these forms of hate, but coming together as a community, that's where we're starting to see change. That's where we see coalition building. That's where we're demystifying the other. And that's important because now we're not exactly strangers, we become neighbors that's the kind of community that I want to live in. That's great. Thank you for that. Now, um, help me understand uh, the AJC perspective on this. So what, what's going on in our culture right now, where we are, and let me say, just from my personal perspective, rightly so, where we, where we are sensitive to our language and actions when it comes to people's color or immigration status or sexual identity or physical or mental capacities. You know, we live in a time now where we don't dress up our kids or even as adults, uh, you know, in certain costumes for Halloween because they're considered cultural appropriation. We don't have white people playing Asian characters in films anymore. And again, in my opinion, all of this is a good thing, but it does feel like sometimes when it comes to Jews, everything from a relatively harmless Jewish joke to a non-Jew playing a Jew on TV or in the movies, all the way to something Terrible like a Jewish person being attacked on the streets in L.A. or New York. Um, sometimes it feels like the reaction is, eh, you know, get over it. Uh, you know, how, how does the AJC view this? I think you touched on, you know, a little bit about, you know, the, the, this time we live in and we are more culturally sensitive than we've ever been before, but sometimes it feels to Jewish people like we're on the outside looking in when it comes to that. 
Yeah, I definitely understand what you mean, both personally, and I, I hear it, it was brought up today, you know, in a conversation that I was in with one of my board members of, you know, if I was enter other groups, you know, name here, they wouldn't be treating me in this way, or this wouldn't be done in this way. So I, I totally sympathize with, with that feeling um, of, you know, why aren't people taking anti-Semitism as seriously as they'll take other forms of hate and discrimination? Again, I think part of that goes back to the unique form of anti-Semitism. You know, you said it, it's the world's oldest hatred. It has its roots. You saw anti-Semitism back in Greco-Roman times, but it really took off um, in, in kind of ancient Christian history with the charge of deicide, the, the false claim that Jews killed Jesus, which again, not true, incorrect. And in fact, the Catholic Church even came out in Nostra Aetate um, to not only apologize as such, but to kind of set the record straight on that. I love data. I love history. So I, I could take a little bit too long in the, the history of anti-Semitism. So I'm going to kind of bring it forward to 2021, where we really started to see anti-Semitism in the streets. And by that, I mean, there was the Hamas instigated conflict um, in Israel and American Jews were being attacked in the street, New York City, Los Angeles, places in between simply because they were Jewish. That to me is a very clear example of what anti-Semitism is because who were these innocent diners in New York and LA and elsewhere? What do they have to do with the actions of a foreign government thousands of miles away? Spoiler, they don't. So that right there, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into it a little bit of anti-Zionism versus anti-Semitism, but it's another moment where what's happening else around the globe it's connected back to the Jewish people, which here in the United States, we only make up 2% of the population. Um, I've got some statistics that we can talk about later that shows of all the hate crimes in the United States, how many are affecting the Jewish community in, in, in the US. And it's really startling for me. But again, what we're talking about, it, it can be really hard to name anti-Semitism. It doesn't look like other forms of hate. So people don't think when they're punching, you know, so the Jewish community, we're seeing it as, I'm feeling it as punching down, but they may not think so because, well, the Jews are fine. They have white privilege. And let me tell you, my friend, it's not so much of a privilege if you have to constantly hide your identity and, you know, hide your star of David out of fear of being attacked because you're dining at a kosher deli, right? Um, also, I wouldn't call that privilege at all, that you have to hide parts of your identity just to fit in somewhere. Uh, so yeah, anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is on the rise. We see it in the far right. We definitely see it on the far left. And that's where we see it a little bit more in that identity, politic, white privilege type sense. We also see the rise of anti-Semitism in religious extremists of, of all stripes and backgrounds, particularly in that, you know, nationalists, white nationalists. So there's a lot of different places that anti-Semitism is coming from. And because of course it would be, it is different coming from all of those sources. AJC's unique role in this fight is to be able to not only have an action plan to combat all forms of anti-Semitism, regardless of the source, but also to work with the non-Jewish community, to educate them on what anti-Semitism is and its many forms, but also what to do when they hear anti-Semitism, when they see anti-Semitism, to get folks to feel comfortable speaking out. It may seem so simple to say, hey, you know, we, we don't say that anymore. Or wow, that's actually really offensive. And I'm not sure if you know this, you're a really nice person, but that's actually a really harmful stereotype. And I'm sure you wouldn't have said that if you knew, knew that. So I just, as your friend, I wanted you to know, right? Like it can be so simple to, to kind of diffuse moments like that. But I don't think, you know, your everyday person is thinking about anti-Semitism perhaps as much as I do. So that's part of my job is to get out there into the community. And this tonight's conversation with so many of you who, who are taking your time to learn about it, this is a really critical step to raise awareness, to educate. All of that makes a difference when it comes to combating anti-Semitism. Yeah, you know, and I was going to ask this later on, but it's coming up now in the conversation. So I'll ask you know, what do you know about how the non-Jewish population views anti-Semitism and how does specifically uh, AJC reach out to other religious groups, to elected officials, to business groups? And like, 
you know, like so many other institutions and businesses, WBEZ, who I work for, has a DEI council, a diversity, equity, and inclusion council. So, you know, I want to wrap this all up kind of into one big question. You're like, how is AJC reaching out to these DEI councils to maybe give talks or share important resources and information? How how are you getting the word out to the sort of larger non-Jewish world? Absolutely. Well, we're doing it at all levels in lots of different forms. So tonight's conversation is one great example. Community awareness, putting it out to the public. I personally am super curious to know even just the background of the folks who are taking the time to be with us tonight. You know, if you're Jewish or not Jewish, because especially for the non-Jews out there, like a gold star, like you did it. You're, you're learning about others, which is so important because again, when we learn and when we know more, we can do and be better. We also work AJC on all sorts of different levels, whether it's with elected officials or religious and, and faith and ethnic leaders to both educate them, who are the Jewish people, what is anti-Semitism, what are the ways in which it negatively impacts our communities, but also really positive things like Jewish pride. So the fact that May is Jewish American Heritage Month um, or even more somber occasions like to honor the um, Holocaust Remembrance Day and the lives of so many innocent individuals who were murdered at the hands of the Nazis. So there's lots of opportunity for education, but to get kind of more into your question of, of why, why are people interested? Personally, and maybe I'm a little naive, I do think that for most folks, like people are good, right? And I, I know that comes across as really simplistic, but I see it play out in our work. I see it play out in AJC's interfaith and intergroup dialogues. I, we just had an early Hanukkah party last week, AJC Chicago, and over 75 of our partners came out. So we had diplomats representing 20 different countries. We had interfaith and intergroup leaders, you know, from the Methodist, the Presbyterian Church, the Mormon Church. So it just it spreads the gamut, and I'm I'm naming them because I'm not just bragging about relationships that we have with other faith groups. I'm naming them because they're our actual friends. We've, we've developed real meaningful partnerships with them over time where we got to learn about their community too. We got to learn about what's important to them and what are some of the issues facing their communities. And in turn, we also shared about ours so that unfortunately, when there are incidents of anti-Semitism that comes up, we have partners who actually reached out to check in on us and who spoke out about anti-Semitism which quite frankly speaks volumes, no pun intended, but one huge way, and we can talk about many others, but one huge way to combat anti-Semitism is to call it out. It's to speak out, it's to condemn it, to say that it is not something that you support and that you also stand with the Jewish community. These things are so critical in the fight against anti-Semitism because people who may not understand or may hear it from one source or some other type of misinformation will hear from someone else that they do know, oh, wait, oh, well, I know Jenny and she's calling this out, but I thought from this friend. And so it creates for dialogue, for understanding. That's what we want to get at. We don't want our communities separated and isolated. We want to come together. We want to learn about one another so that we can be a supportive community as a whole. That's where a healthy community thrives. Now, you mentioned calling it out. Uh, I want to ask uh, just a couple of more questions here. Um, and then I and then I really want to go to some of the facts and figures that you've got. Um, there have always been anti-Semites, all right, but for the past 60 years or so since the Shoah, um, for the most part, not in all cases, they've stayed in their basements or occasionally they would print a few hundred copies of a newsletter and put it under somebody's car windshield or go to a small meeting. But today, you know, you one per, uh, can pull out their phone and uh, their beliefs and their lies and their slanders could reach untold millions in every corner of the world. Um, so the first part of this question is, how is AJC dealing with the plural proliferation of hate speech in social media and the online world? So one big way in which we're doing it, again, is speaking out about it. But we're not just doing that, you know, on our own Twitter or on our own social media or just, you know, to everybody who gets our press releases. 
we're also going to the social media companies themselves. AJC, since we've been around since 1906, we are seen as a trusted resource. We are seen as a trusted organization and that's something we take really seriously. It's one of the reasons why AJC is a staunchly nonpartisan organization because we want to be able to work with any member of government at whatever political party they're a part of, if they can help make the community, the United States more safe for the Jewish people, that's what we wanna work on to get there. So when you talk about social media companies, we're having not only trainings for, for senior management of social media companies, we're also doing more in-depth uh, research with them and also discussions. So for example, social media algorithms, when they're using that for moderated content, sometimes it's a human moderator, other times it's just AI. So how is that AI getting programmed? What is the AI using for their definition of anti-Semitism? And how do they know whether or not it's hate speech? Again, it's why tools like the IRA working definition are so important because you can put that definition into a social media company's algorithm when it comes to moderation and hate, and it can flag it, right? Like that's just a very simple way in which social media companies can help take action to remove hate from their platform. There's also just the deplatforming of anti Semites. You know, I hear a lot about First Amendment concerns and this or that. Yes, your First Amendment is there to protect that speech. A, it doesn't mean you won't have consequences. And B, social media companies are not the town square, right? Like they are private companies who have their own terms of service. There is no one saying that you are obligated to keep them up there and, and to keep these posts out there. Because again, when hate is left to fester unchecked, that's when it becomes normalized. And particularly when it comes to anti-Semitism, the normalization of it is extremely dangerous territory. The Jewish people, we have a long memory we know what happens when hate gets normalized. We saw it just as you said, you know, less than 75 years ago. So this is very, very real. And, and for some of us, it's in living memory, right? So there is a lot that social media companies can still do. AJC has a new call to action on our website. So I'll, I'll put some um, resources into the chat in a little bit, but there's one specifically tailored for social media companies, just as there's one for corporations and for elected officials and for the federal government. There's all sorts of different ways because again, it's going to take a tailored approach based on where your background is and where your role is in society. You know, if you're an elected official, if you work for a corporation, if you are part of a faith movement, there's things that all of us can do to combat this hate. And it's incumbent upon all of us to do something. Sitting on the sidelines is not an option anymore. We all have to come together to take action. All right, I have so many other specific questions I would love to ask you and I hope I can about uh, college campuses and about Israeli politics. But, you know, what I would love for you to sort of, you know, we started this conversation by saying anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Semitic acts are on the rise. And, you know, some people want to know, well, how do you know that? What do you mean by that? Well, you've been looking at a lot of different uh place you've been looking in a lot of different places and crunching a bunch of numbers so would you sort of share some of these numbers with us to give us an idea of what is going on right now yeah absolutely so the past three years AJC has put out a state of anti-semitism in America survey and it's unique in a sense and in fact it's the largest survey of the U.S. Uh, general public and American Jews and because of that we know we can trust this data we used a leading research firm SSRS to be able to conduct this data and what we found was really startling not just the survey responses themselves but also the differences between the U.S. general public and their perception on anti-Semitism and Jewish Americans, and not only their perceptions, but their lived experiences with anti-Semitism. So we're going to have our 2022 survey come out in late January. It's going to be a, a year in review, so I'm going to have even more up-to-date facts and figures. But it's not just AJC surveys, which, which are data that can be trusted because we've seen how it all plays out but we also utilize the FBI hate crime statistics. And in fact, we just had the new statistics for 2021, yes, you're hearing me correctly, last year, drop today. 
I wish I had better news for those statistics, but I want to kind of nerd out a little bit if you'll indulge me, because why these hate crimes matter and why hate crimes are being reported also impacts federal funding and it impacts local funding as well. And this year, unfortunately, we have seen as we're starting to go through the data that there was a switch in how data gets reported to the FBI. So you're seeing cities like New York, Los Angeles, Miami, who didn't report at all this year. And I love to believe there were no hate crimes in New York City, but I also live in the real world. Chicago did report for, towards, the hate, uh, towards the FBI hate crime statistics, but it also recorded zero. So that's a moment for me where I say, okay, I'm gonna just hold out for 2022 and AJC is gonna continue during our survey work. And again, what that shows is deeply concerning. So. We just look at our, our 2021 data. The question was, how much of a problem do you think anti-Semitism is in the United States today? 90%, nine out of 10 American Jews said it's a problem, where only 60% of the US general public thought it was a problem. I'm an optimist, so I'm gonna say 60% more than I thought, like that, that's a win. But if you also look at our another survey question of within the last five years, within the last 12 months, do you think anti-Semitism has increased? You see stark differences between the US general public and American Jews with American Jews time and time again saying, yes, anti-Semitism has increased. We also see it in our survey reporting of changed behavior. Why should changing behavior matter? Why, why does that make a difference? Because AJC, as a global Jewish advocacy organization, we've seen this happen. We've seen it play out in Europe, where 20 years ago, anti-Semitism was really on the rise. And we saw that European Jews were starting to change their behavior. They wouldn't wear a kippah in public, or they would hide if they wore a Star of David necklace because they understood the real security risks of, of identifying themselves publicly with Jews. And we saw the corresponding rise in hate and anti-Semitism go along with that. You know, we were, we were talking before about anti-Semitism in America. Five years ago, you know, during my first stint with AJC, the anti-Semitism we talked about was mostly overseas. It wasn't so much here in the United States. And I feel like that's now what I deal with on an almost daily basis. So we're really seeing anti-Semitism increase in the United States and around the world. And again, it's incumbent on all of us to speak out, to stand up, to do something. People can't be bystanders anymore. We need to be active upstanders and to learn from our history and to stand up and speak out, not only for issues affecting the Jewish community, but for all of us. Uh, there was a White House roundtable last week. Yes. Uh, Doug Emhoff, the uh, husband of the vice president, the second dude, I guess some people call him, uh, was leading it, also participating in the event. Uh, Deborah Lipstadt, who you mentioned earlier, who is the State Department anti-Semitism envoy. Uh, White House domestic policy advisor, Susan Rice, you know, um, dozens, uh, roughly a dozen Jewish organizations. And, you know, there already exists a number of governmental systems designed to fight anti-Semitism. There's a dedicated office uh, for countering anti-Semitism overseas. There's uh, a federal registry of anti-Semitic incidents run by the FBI. Uh, of course, there are federal hate crime laws which have been proven effective as a deterrent and uh, in the world of punishment. But, you know, what, according to the AJC, what more can government be doing? I'm so glad you asked. And this was one of the things. So AJC, we were in that meeting. AJC CEO Ted Deutsch was there. Um, and he also really pressed upon the second gentleman to encourage the Biden administration to take concrete action. So like I mentioned, AJC has been dealing with anti-Semitism around the world. And so we know what works and what has not been as successful. One thing that does work is to have a coordinated national action plan for anti-Semitism. And literally minutes before this presentation began, I saw a, a press release that came out that the Biden administration has indeed created a task force to create a national anti-Semitism strategy. So yes to everything you said about the things that exist in place, but sometimes because governments can be a little bureaucratic, 
they don't exactly talk to one another. And so having a comprehensive action plan that also works in state, local, and federal government into all of the different federal agencies, that's where you're going to see the most robust response. That's where AJC has seen the greatest amount of success overseas. And we know it's something that can succeed in America as well. So I was thrilled to see the fast action from this current administration on ways in which especially in this climate of rising anti-Semitism, they're working together in a bipartisan manner to help combat anti-Semitism. Uh, you mentioned we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about how anti-Semitism comes from both the right and the left. Um, college campuses have been over the last decade or so, maybe more and more unfriendly to Jewish students generally, and specifically students who outwardly support Israel, and student groups and faculty have worked hard um, to make the word Zionism a uh, simile for racism, uh, apartheid, colonialism, and genocide. So how is AJC directly addressing that? And what other groups are they working with to try to, uh, you know, give Jewish kids on campuses a more safe space? Yeah, I love this question. So AJC, we work with a lot of different other groups on campus. We're a part of the Israel on Campus Coalition, which is a group of more than 20 different organizations committing to combat anti-Jewish hate on campus. But we also work really closely with Hillel's. Um, here in Illinois, we work super closely with Hillel and Federation. They're really great partners in this fight. And we also think about the continuum to college, right? It's not anti-Semitism and the Jewish students on campus. It's, it's a little, it's almost too late to wait until they're on campus. So AJC has a high school leadership advocacy program called Leaders for Tomorrow, or LIFT for shorthand. And it helps train young Jews to be strong in their Jewish identity. Because I think that first and foremost is one critical way in which to help combat anti-Jew hatred on campus, or certainly it can support these Jewish students when they're dealing with anti-Israel issues on campus. And that's also where we start to see, I mentioned earlier, you know, you see um, um, American Jews change their behavior when it comes to anti-Semitism. We're seeing it in a really unique way on college campuses with Jewish students sometimes being afraid or um, not wanting to be so public about the fact that they're Jewish or maybe that they support Israel because they're a Zionist. And for those of whom are, are on this call and don't know what that means, Zionism is a movement that enhances or is there to uh, support the self-determination of the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland. So what you see on college campuses is a lot of anti-Zionism and just to your point, it's mixed in with apartheid and racism and, and made to seem like a very dirty word. And I'm seeing this brilliant new group of Gen Zers who fully reject that thinking for one, and two say, well, how come my, me as a Jew, how come I'm the only person, the only group who's not allowed to seek self-determination in my own ancestral homeland? You know, it's saying nothing about the Palestinians and their also equally valid right to self-determination. So why are Jews being singled out? And again, going back to the IRA working definition, that's one of the working examples. When Jews or the state of Israel are being singled out alone with unfair criticism or, or critiques that no other country is also being leveled with, that's a, you know, that's a pretty clear outline for me anyways of when something is very much veering into anti-Semitism category. When you're not going to be, you know, for Jewish students on campus, for example, to compare them to any other group, you're not going to deny your support of another group if a potential country where their people come from, you know, takes some type of foreign policy stance. You're just, you're just not seeing that, but you are seeing it being applied to Jewish students on campus. And that's where we see really unique types of anti-Semitism begin to, to grow and foster. And that's really dangerous, right? So that's not what we want for Jewish students on campus. It's not what we want for any student on campus, Jewish or not. Yeah, well, but many people will claim 
I'm not anti-Jewish, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm anti-Zionist. Mm -hmm. Is that possible and why or why not? There are times you could probably, you know, draw a very fine line where anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. I've yet to be fully convinced of that. You know, I, I think there's one thing to say, you know, well, nation states are a 19th and 20th century fiction. So I don't, I don't believe that there should be any states. Okay, fine, fine. You know, token anti-Zionist. Okay. Um, but more often than not, particularly what we see on college campuses are Jewish students being vilified because they have a connection to their ancestral home because they traveled to Israel. You're not seeing that with Jewish students who are studying abroad in China or who care, you know, about other people. You're not saying to Iranian students right now, oh, well, we can't support you unless we hear you loudly denounce your government, right? Like, you're not hearing, you're not seeing those things. So again, that for me is a very clear indicator of a lack of sincerity, A, in the their argument, and B, that it's more likely than not some anti-Semitic motivation getting there. And a lot of people, particularly on the far left, so maybe not a lot, but people on the far left get really riled up when I kind of point that out. They, they don't like that, they disagree, they're entitled to disagree, um, but I've seen how it plays out and it's not a good look for them. Uh, speaking of Israel, um... Benjamin Netanyahu is going to be the new, or it is, uh, I, I don't know if it's official official yet, but he is going to be the prime minister again. And he's struck a deal recently to create a government with a number of what people inside and outside of Israel are calling far right and extremists who are openly and proudly um, anti-gay, anti-Arab, anti-laws and courts that aren't Torah-derived, and anti-any stream of Judaism that isn't orthodox. So my question is, how does somebody who fancies themselves a progressive person who has defended Israel time and time again with, you don't have all your facts straight, and let me give you history and context, how do those people prepare for a potential new wave of attacks, mostly from the left in this case, that will use this new reality against Jews here in the United States? I think about it in a couple of different ways. Um, one, I bring it back to America. So I think to those same, because you name them progressives or far left, you know, did they suddenly stop supporting America? you know, in 2016, which if I assume if they're progressive, you know, they perhaps voted a different way than, um, you know, what elected President Trump. So did they stop supporting America? Did they stop fighting for their ideals during his tenure? Probably not. So the same can be true for Jewish students and Jewish individuals who love Israel. They can still advocate for the issues that they care about because they are part of the diaspora Jewry, you know, that the world um, that we are all kind of connected to, if you will. So another way in which I think about it, just to, to really narrow in on your question, is that there's a lot of things that are said on the campaign trail. There's a lot of things that candidates have made statements with in the past that are vile, that we disagree with, that I personally disagree with. What is said on the campaign trail doesn't always translate into policies for governments. And so, I mean, a lot of people, and I think in this fast paced day and age, you know, people don't like this answer. Part of it is going to have to wait and see what the government's actually going to do. When HAC um, saw how the, the elections kind of turned out, we put out our own press statement where you know, some Jewish groups were praising it. Some gr Jewish groups were saying, oh my gosh, it's the end of Israel as we know it. AJC, we, we came out with our centrist right down the line approach, which of course we would, this is, this is AJC's character and said, while we will work with the Netanyahu government, we're also going to continue to advocate for the policies and the values that we hold dear which are pluralism, which are democratic values, which are inclusion and increased opportunities for peace and normalization. That's not going to change on AJ season just because of who is in the prime minister seat and who he elects for certain members of the Knesset and, and for ministerial positions. 
if anything, as we've seen in Israel's parliamentary system play out over these last several years, coalitions are fragile. We're seeing this democratic process at work. So I also have to like, you know, I'm a data nerd. So I'm looking in the data. How did Israelis vote? Help me understand, you know, why is this in such a way? And if you'll forgive me for reading, because I, I don't have these memorized, but I do think it's really interesting. And again, like map it out to other countries around the world. Let's make sure that we're not just singling out Israel because it just happens to be the only Jewish state in the world. So I want to just, if you'll indulge me, out of the 40 parties that ran in the November 1 Israeli elections, only 10 crossed the threshold to be able to form a party in the Knesset. So again, it's a bit different than, and than U.S. politics. Um, so only one on that list is considered far right, and it only garnered 11% of the total seats in the Knesset, that's Israeli um, parliament. So in other words, almost 90% of Israelis voted for any other party across a variety of the political spectrum. So the, the Likud bloc, the one that um, Bibi Netanyahu oversees, it won 32 Knesset seats, about half of the block of the parties that's recommended. And so I, I want to kind of put that into a little bit perspective. Like, like, let's look at Germany, for example, another democratic country. Their radical AFD uh, political group, they also won 11% of the votes in Germany's elections last year. But nobody is going around saying like, oh my gosh, this minority party is going to come and change Germany's democratic character and it's going to change the face of it. So in moments like that where, yeah, I totally get why it's stressful for folks. And yes, I do think there's going to be moments where it may be uniquely more challenging for progressives and say for other um, folks on the political spectrum. But I do have the faith in Israel as a democracy and organized groups like AJC and others to help hold that government accountable and be a government for all of its people in Israel, not just, you know, the unique few who think and believe a certain way. We've already seen that come out with Bibi who said, you know, no, I'm not going to ban the gay pride parade. So, you know, there's a lot of talk right now. I'm really interested in seeing how anything gets translated into action. That's what we have to judge things on, not what we may fear what's going to happen in the future. All right. I've got one more question for you, and then I'm going to turn it over to questions from the audience, because I've asked a couple of questions about anti-Semitism from the left. Uh, and so I wanted to be fair and ask about some anti-Semitism from the right. And I, I know a lot of Jews who are very pro-Donald Trump. And they tell me that no president has been better for the Jews than Donald Trump. Or they say, how can he be an anti-Semite? His daughter converted and his grandchildren are Jews. But yet the man does seem to regularly find himself in the company of neo-Nazis, all right, or close to it. And one of the greatest anti-Semitic tropes of all is the dual loyalty trope, where, which means that Jews, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we are more loyal to Israel than we are to the United States or whatever country we happen to be living at the time. And you know, one of the keys to the MAGA movement is grievances, as in someone is taking away our way of life and they must be stopped. And whenever we've heard that throughout history, the they, you know, is often the Jews. So my question is, what has the AJC done to push back on some of Mr. Trump's either statements or the company that he keeps or indirectly? How have you uh, reached out to Jewish Republicans uh, to express your feelings about some of his statements and et cetera? So I think one thing to answer your last question first is, um, you know, Jewish Republicans have a happy home in AJC, just as Jewish Democrats and Jewish independents, because we are a centrist, nonpartisan organization. We're about principles, not politics. And so we're able to speak out regardless of who is in charge, regardless of who is sitting in the White House. We are going to speak truth to power 
full stop. So, you know, a lot of people had a hard time, for example, with the Abraham Accords and the fact that that was signed under President Trump's tenure. The Abraham Accords and, and normalization between Israel and countries around the Middle East have been something that EJC has worked on for over 25 years. So the fact that they were able to get it across the finish line is something we celebrated and continue to do so. You know, just because of some how someone may think or feel about other things that Donald Trump has said or done, doesn't negate the fact of, of some things that were positively done under his tenure. And so if you take us now into more recent things, like I said, we'll speak truth to power. We called out former President Trump about his recent meeting that he had in Mar-a-Lago with Kanye West and Nick Fuentes. Like, don't be inviting rabid anti-Semites to your home or, or to be meeting with them. Like that sends a very specific kind of message I can't speak to his intentions, but I did see reporting after the fact that President, former President Trump did think that that was going to blow over and didn't think it would be make such a big deal. We are making a big deal. They're anti-Semites should not be normalized in any in any capacity. They shouldn't have their platforms expanded or or being given any sense of legitimacy. So yeah, we are still calling on former President Trump to apologize for that, to denounce the his guests, you know, comments and behaviors, because that's not what we should see in any kind of elected leader, former or one who perhaps wants to become a leader again. So AJC is going to continue to force fully speak out regardless of who it may be. Um, and, you know, just as when AJC speaks out on issues that happen on the left, I can tell you, you know, personally that um, some far left Jews or, or Jews who hold, you know, far left uh, kind of feelings or, or political beliefs, yeah, they too don't always love it. I mean, I, I think that's one of the challenges and, and what I'm talking about when I say we have to call out anti-Semitism wherever its source may be. It's super convenient and easy to call out somebody on a who is on a pol different political side as you may personally hold and say like, oh, well, you need to have your side condemn anti-Semitism. Yes, and you also have to be willing and brave enough, quite frankly, to also call out anti-Semitism when it's in your own ranks and when it's on your own side. That's where the real work begins. It's easy to call out your opponent and say you're an anti-Semite or you've said anti-Semitic things or you know, you're irredeemable. All of us can make amends. All of us can apologize for the wrong we've done and the harm we've caused and take meaningful steps forward. We've seen it play out in history and we will see it again in the future provided we've got partners who are willing to say, wow, okay, I didn't know, or perhaps I didn't understand it to that full extent, and I don't want to cause that harm. I want to take the reparations and do the right thing and make amends, not make this mistake again. I have faith and hope that, that there are good people out there who are willing to learn from their mistakes. And again, coming back to you know anti-Semitism, a lot of people just don't understand what it is or how certain phrases or, or things are anti-Semitism. So, um, you know, to say to, to Jew one down, you know, to try and negotiate, well, that phrase is an anti-Semitic phrase and it's rooted in historic anti-Semitism. EJC has a fantastic resource guide called Translate Hate, which you can visit at translatehate.org. And it breaks down common tropes and phrases, and it also gives you the historic background to it. So for me personally, you know, if I'm scrolling on social media and I just happen to see something um, that comes up, you know, as anti-Semitism, but just packaged in a 21st century way, quite frankly, it's a little boring because a lot of it's the same. It's just rebranded for a new day. But now I know what I can do. I can report it to the social media companies. I can reply back to the person that I saw who posted it and, and invite them in for a conversation or say like, hey, I'm not sure if you know, but what you posted is actually an anti-Semitic canard or it's an anti-Semitic anti um, story that's that's factually incorrect. And this causes real harm to me and my community. Like, would you please take it down? You know, some folks will actually listen and will do the right thing. Not everybody, but just because not everybody will doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying. Beth, this would be a great time, I think, to get in some questions that 
audience members have submitted, if you would be so kind. And by the yes. way, thank you. Thank you to everybody who's sticking with us. Uh, we're going to go for a little while longer and maybe your question has been answered or maybe your question will be answered. So uh, Beth, take it away. Thank you, Sarah and Jason for this conversation. It's been wonderful. Um, before we start with the questions, we're, there'll be a quick poll that will pop up on your screen just to let us know how many are joining us tonight. It'll be up on your screen for just a few seconds. So if you all can take a minute to answer that, that'll be great. And then we'll start with our questions. Thank you. So we had one comment that um, from someone who is joining us this evening, and he said, I am Asian and here to learn your culture and history. When you mentioned Jewish people had been attacked on the street, I'm curious how the um, attacker can tell that you are Jewish. It's not easy to identify, correct? It can be, and that is such a great question. And, and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you for being willing to learn. All of these things are super important and they all contribute to a vibrant and healthy society. So I think um, based on what I've heard from some of the anti-Semitic incidents that I personally know about, there was a couple of different identifying factors. So um, a Jewish person, depending on how they observe their Judaism, may wear a small cap on their head called a kippah or a yarmulke. So they could be wearing that. Someone like me could be wearing, I don't know if you can see them, Star of David earrings or a Star of David necklace. Um, there's uh, sects of Judaism like the Haredim or an ultra-Orthodox who have very specific dress. And within the world of orthodoxy, there's all sorts of different ways in which that, that dress can look. Um, but to perhaps an outsider, it may all look the same, you know, a specific hat and your, you know, modesty dress or, or you're wearing X, Y, and Z. Um, that particularly in New York City is, um, so orthodox individuals are typically at the brunt of physical acts of anti-Semitic violence because they're a bit more identifiable in a stereotypical sense. You know, like someone like me with red hair, you know, you may not think that I look Jewish. Fun fact about Judaism is we come in all sorts of different colors and sizes and backgrounds. You know, the Jewish people live around the world. You can get black Jews from Ethiopia, Persian Jews from Iran. You know, here in the United States, there are so many different Jewish individuals who have all sorts of different practices religiously and non. So that also makes combating anti-Semitism a little bit more challenging because it's so much easier to like have one type of person who fits in one type of box and you know, they are problem solved. But the Jewish people are really diverse people. And yet we only make up 0.2% of the global population. So we are such a minority in this world, even if we may have select members of our community who have reached levels of prominence and, and more celebrity, if you will. Um, but there's no one way in which a Jewish person looks. There's no one way in which a Jewish person acts. Some people will hear Hebrew on the street and that will be enough to set them off. Um, but the Jewish people have been using Hebrew for millennia and it's a, a language that you know, was revived with the state of Israel being created as well. So again, I'm not going to stop um, being a loud and proud Jew just because there's a risk of an anti-Semite getting upset about it. I'm gonna do what I can and be educated and prepared and know how I can take action. Thank you. Um... This is a little bit on a similar note to what you just ended with. I have an 11, 13, and 16-year-old children and live in a predominantly non-Jewish community. How would you suggest I help my kids understand that they can be proud of their heritage, but may have to hide it? It's really hard. And so I think one thing, first and foremost, is to be able to know and name for yourself what you love about your Judaism, what you love about being Jewish, what gives you pride in the Jewish peoplehood, and to instill that pride in your family. 
I think when they're going to be in places that aren't a lot of Jews, perhaps that's also helping to build out within their social circles a little bit more of a casual intro to Judaism or intro to how your family is Jewish. So maybe that looks like inviting your children's friends over to light Hanukkah candles with you all and to tell the story of Hanukkah and why it's so important, particularly in today's day and age, to shine a light about anti-Semitism and to increase that light every single day during the eight days. You know, there's things that all of us can do. Um, I also think when you're talking with children, of course, it needs to be age appropriate. We don't want them to be afraid of being Jewish or afraid of being able to be identified as Jewish. But it's also important to know that if they hear something or they're in a classroom or with their friends in the schoolyard and something makes them uncomfortable, that they can talk to you about it and not feel like, you know, I don't know, the world is going to end, which I'm sure is not the case, but you know, you want to ensure that your children can come and speak to you freely about it. And sometimes they may just want to talk about it and no action needs to be taken. You ultimately are the adult and will know when you need to involve, you know, school officials or, or what have you, should God forbid something happen. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different ways to instill a vibrant Jewish pride and also help educate your non-Jewish neighbors about the vibrancy of the Jewish people and the Jewish faith, um, and that even though you may not believe the same things or, or share the same ethnic background, you still care about similar things. You may care about democracy and pluralism and democratic values and living in a society in a town that values pluralism. So there's, I think, lots of positive things um, to be able to celebrate with them while also helping to educate your kids that you know, age appropriate, we do live in the real world. And there unfortunately are people out there who don't like the Jewish people. And so we need to have that situ situational awareness to know when, um, when places or areas may not be as safe as for them as children as perhaps uh, other places. Thank you. Uh, one of our attendees has um, noted that Cook County Commissioner Scott Britton has launched the Cook County United Against Hate initiative after receiving anti-Semitic materials on his driveway in Glenview. We have a website. Please reach out and sign the pledge. The website is cookcountyunitedagainsthate.com. Hate against one is hate against all. So, Sarah, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Thank um, you. I've heard about it, but I hadn't seen the website, so I just wrote it down. Thank you. Thank you, listener. Um, excited to We can try again. to include the website in our... Um, uh, email to attendees after tonight's event. Perfect. But that's great. And I, I love that the commissioner is helping to take action on this. And, um, you know, I read something actually in Wisconsin because um, an anti-Semitic hate group was putting, you know, littering what they thought were Jewish homes in, in specific Jewish neighborhoods with anti-Semitic flyers and propaganda. And the local police uh, in that town were able to prosecute based off of littering. So I wasn't thinking that littering in some ways was gonna save the day with that, but there you go. We've got laws on the books and sometimes you've got really creative law enforcement who will be able to work within the confines of the law to help bring protection to Jewish communities and prosecution to those who seek to cause harm and, and fear. Thank you. Um, this question is for you, Sarah. It says that you talk about HAC working with various groups. Can you tell us a little bit about what that work actually entails? Yeah, so um, here on the North Shore, we've worked with Hadassah North Shore to help get more towns and municipalities to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. And that matters because it's a tool that governments can use as a form of education so that if issues come up or if anti-Semitism is rearing its ugly head in their town, they now have a tool to use to apply to their standards for how to address certain issues or how to recommend it to law enforcement. So we've worked with Hadassah, we've partnered with other groups like EDL on other issues, both locally here in Chicago, but also on a national level. There's lots of ways in which our Jewish organizations can partner together and play to our strengths while also working in a collective way to combat anti-Semitism and hate in all of its forms. And we're really proud of that. 
Um, we have another question that says, can you cite some specific information regarding anti-Semitic behavior in Chicago land and how a community can respond? Yeah, absolutely. So let me pull up, if you'll again, indulge my reading. So I want to make sure that I'm giving you actual statistics since, since you're seeking them too. So let's take a macro view of the United States. So in the 2020 FBI hate crime statistics, anti-Jewish bias incidents comprised 8.7% of all U.S. hate crimes in 2020. So even though Jewish Americans only make up 2% of the U.S. population, anti-Jewish hate crimes were one out of every 11 hate crimes that occurred in America in 2020. So here in the Midwest, since your question was more specifically about Chicago, we also saw that we were able to disaggregate the data from AJC's survey of anti-Semitism in America for the Midwest, as well as disaggregate the FBI hate crime statistics. And here in the Midwest, the FBI in 2020 reported for 546 hate crime incidents in the broader Midwest region, which was a 40, almost 45% increase from 2019. So we're really seeing these incidents rise. Um, we're also, again, as I kind of referenced this a little bit earlier with the hate crimes data, not every agency reports or is reporting in the way that the FBI needs to collect that data. So that's a really critical thing. And one of the issues and ways in which AJC advocates with law enforcement is to ensure that they're reporting it in all of the appropriate ways so that it gets counted. Because when you know about an incident, you can actually do something about it. You can take the resources that are available and put together a concrete action plan to address the needs as they are. So in Illinois, the um, largest cities that we saw, we saw 68 reported hate crime incidents in 2019 compared to 56 reported in 2020. So I'll take that positive where I can see it. Um, but also you've got, you know, just you mentioned the city of Chicago. So just the other month, uh, the Chicago Commission on Hate Crimes, um, a Commission on Human Relations, excuse me, reported on hate crimes. And uh, over that period, they received seven, 77 hate crime reports to their commission. And of that, 18 of them targeted Jewish individuals where the next minority group, and that was kind of the, of, of all of the groupings, the most was against Jewish individuals. The next grouping there was against Black Americans. And so again, you kind of see these um, minority groups being targeted disproportionately when they don't make up kind of the majority population in a specific area. What's also concerning, again, it goes back to hate crime reporting. The Chicago Commission on Human Relations reported 77 during a specific time period where the Chicago police received almost 120, a little bit more. So there's a discrepancy on, on where it's being reported and to whom. This is what I definitely want to put in the chat because if you're not sure, we haven't really talked about what do you do if you're not sure how to report a hate crime. A, contact your um, elected officials, they can help you, but more importantly, contact law enforcement. And if you're not 100% comfortable or you're not sure, feel free to talk and call to a Jewish organization because we can help get you plugged in. That's one of the things that we're here to do, but I do wanna put um, the Justice Department's website on there. There's ways in which you can report online. And one thing that we've learned from our FBI partners is to not make the decision yourself whether something is or is not anti-Semitic or is a hate crime. Allow the experts to determine whether or not something falls into that pattern. And even if it doesn't rise to the level of a hate crime, it's critically important that law enforcement knows about this because they're able to track patterns and they can help stop something before it gets so much worse. So it's really, it's really, really incredibly important that we speak up against anti-Semitism and hate in all of its forms, because that again is what's going to make for a safer society for all of us. Thank you. We um, will take one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jason again to conclude with a couple questions of his own. So. Um, someone is asking, when you're in college, how do you know um, when you see a form of anti-Semitism on college campus? 
Yeah, so I think first it's understanding what anti-Semitism is. So you can go to AJC's website and learn more about it. You can go to translatehate.org and find out different forms. But the first thing is to be educated on it. The second one is to take a step back and say, you know, if you're seeing a group protest something that is related to Israel or Zionism or the Jewish people, think to yourself, if I were to insert another group's name here, would this be acceptable? Would this be something that, you know, people of goodwill would also be decrying or calling out or what have you? My gut says probably not, but that would be another indicator there where maybe you should learn more. I think for most people, when something happens, you, you kind of can feel it in your gut. Something doesn't feel quite right. So investigate that. Don't just brush that off and say, oh, maybe it was a weird social interaction. Learn more about anti-Semitism, about the ways in which it manifests. And for college students in particular, if you're not sure, reach out to Jewish groups on campus. Hillel is an incredible resource, not only to just be there for Jewish students, regardless of their religious background or non-religious background, but to support Jewish students to help answer some of these more difficult questions. Thank you. Um, Jason, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to uh, ask a few final questions. That's great, thank you so much, Beth. So, you know, Sarah, I think you've touched on it a little bit in a number of questions, but just again, kind of as we're wrapping up, um, it's so overwhelming and the numbers are scary and the incidents are painful, but you know, we get to the point where an individual says, well, well, what can I do? What can I do? You know, I, I'm just one person sitting here. And if there's something happening over there in New York or in Chicago or down the street or wherever it is, what can I do? What do you tell those people? Well, I say it may not seem like a lot, but speaking out is a really important first step. And people may say, well, I don't have an audience. I, I don't have, you know, people that follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, what have you. The way in which I started before I became regional director, I started talking about it with my non-Jewish friends. And let me tell you, friends, it was really uncomfortable at first because like, I don't know, I don't really talk to my girlfriends normally about anti-Semitism. It's not on our list of topics. Um, but I started talking about it because it affected me and it was really making me depressed and nervous and, and all of the feelings that come up when anti-Semitism is on the rise. And so I started naming for my Jewish, my non-Jewish friends in particular, like, it's been a really hard week because of all this anti-Semitism that I've been seeing on social media. And my non-Jewish friends are like, oh, maybe my algorithm is different than yours. Like, tell me more. And so I, I start there. I started with people in my circle. And then, you know, as part of both my work, but also my community building work, it goes beyond there. So, you know, if you're talking to a neighbor, maybe you raise it with them or at your local town council meeting, you know, show up, be engaged in civic action, right? Um, there's a lot of things that folks can do. I'm gonna put a link in the chat because it breaks down AJC's call to action, lots of different ways in which, um, oh, okay, I'll put it into the chat and then it'll get shared. Uh, lots of ways in which individuals can help take action. So for example, if you are an individual who works for a private company, perhaps talk to your HR department in their diversity, equity, and inclusion area, how they deal with issues related to anti-Jewish hate or anti-Semitism. Do they know what anti-Semitism is? And if not, might they be open to hosting a training, whether it's just for HR staff or something that's open to anybody in the company to learn more about what anti-Semitism is and the ways in which it's going, it manifests um, in corporate life, in regular life, everywhere in between. Another thing that just an individual can do is to contact their elected officials. Local, state, federal, all of those levels matter. Make your voice heard that you want to see the elected officials taking a stand against anti-Semitism, calling it out when it happens, but also to have an action plan for what happens if an anti-Semitic incident happens in their area. What are the steps that they as our elected officials can take? What are they going to do about it? What are they going to do before an incident happens to help educate the general public? 
speaking out about anti-Semitism, it may be so easy to, to underrate that action, but it's so valuable because if it's not called out, if it's not condemned, it's left to fester. And that's where the real trouble really starts to happen. We can't let it get to that point. We've seen it on the rise. We need to beat it back into the fringes where it was before and make sure it's never a part of any type of acceptable social discourse. All right, and finally, what, what are you hopeful about? What, what makes you hopeful? There's a lot of bad news <laughs> that, that you've given us a, a lot of positivity, but it's been around some pretty bad news. All right. So what are you hopeful about? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a pretty positive, upbeat person. I think you've kind of got a sense of that. Um, but yeah, dealing with anti-Semitism all the time, every day is, is hard. It's exhausting. It can be a bit demoralizing. It can feel like, wow, what are we doing that makes a difference? And then I see things that make a difference where people are speaking up, where they're standing out, where I'll have a partner email me and say, I just wanted to check in on you. I, I can tell it's been a really difficult week for the Jewish community. I'm here for you. How are you? And moments like that not only give me hope, but, but bolster me a little bit more. Uh, where I'm, where I have a lot of hope is in the next generation, in Gen Z. I am in awe of them and what I see them do online. And I don't particularly um, think of myself yet as an old person, but I feel really old when I see their stuff. But they are such loud and proud Jews, and they refuse to take flack for that, and they are are willing to stand up and call out anti-Jewish hate, but also to really focus on Jewish pride and what makes being a Jew so, so wonderful and what is so enriching about the Jewish people and being a part of this incredible community. So I'm, I'm so inspired and hopeful by the generations that are, are coming after me by their Jewish pride. It inspires me to be even more out with my Jewish pride. And, um, you know, I, I kept my earrings a little bit small tonight, but we had our Hanukkah party and I was wearing like massive Star of David earrings. You don't need to like, literally wear your Judaism on your, your earrings, on your short sleeve to have Jewish pride. Um, but it's something that, that gives me, it, it's fun. And it's something that um, not just gives me hope, you know, having the ability to be Jewish and to be able to live my Judaism freely and my, to have a, a out Jewish identity, if you will. Um, but I also see that more people are paying attention. So yeah, Social media has made it a lot easier for hate to spread and to reach even more people. But I'm also inspired and I've got hope by the large amounts of individuals, Jewish and not, who are pushing back against that hate, who are doing the right thing, who are standing up, who are saying, okay, I can't fix everything, but I can take this small step. Folks, that small step makes a difference. It really, really does help move the needle. You all being here tonight this makes a difference because you're here to learn, to hopefully be a little bit inspired that there's plenty of things that folks can do at all levels of the spectrum to combat this hate and to make our world a safer and better place for all peoples. Well, I'm really honored to have been asked to be part of this event tonight and to share this stage with you. I'm just going to close by saying, you know, for more than 2,500 years, the most powerful empires in the world have tried to destroy the Jewish people, the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Christian church and the Nazis and the Soviets, and they are all gone. And as we say, Am Yisrael Chai, which is the people of Israel live. But the question is, what kind of world are we living in? And what kind of world will we live in? And will our children live in? And we're all here together in this virtual space. And we're brought together by your local library. And a library is about sharing ideas. And at this very moment, libraries around the country are under threat from a very small but very vocal minority who want to effectively close down libraries, which means closing off ideas. And I'll say that 
we must guard ourselves in our communities, at our institutions from an anti-idea movement because it's a very small step from anti-ideas and anti-learning about others to anti-empathy and anti-Semitism. So with that, I would again love to thank you, Sarah and AJC Chicago. Thanks, Thank you, of Ron. course, to uh, Roz from the Vernon Area Public Library and Grace from Glencoe and Beth from Highland Park and all the libraries who joined in together to make this uh, event happen tonight. And thank you to everybody who tuned in so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jason. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Have a good night. Good night, thank you.